Hey everyone, I'm Brandon, and I'm here at NASIS to, to talk about slipping maps and mediums and also computation. So just to talk about what a slipping map is, um, I'm talking about sort of the most ubiquitous kind of interactive map on the web. It's usually a map that is panable, that is zoomable, and often embedded in some sort of application or visualization. So just as an example, I'm using these OpenStreetMap-based slippy maps in these videos right here. And there's a lot of special purpose tools specifically to make slippy maps on the web. They're not generally made using desktop GIS software. They're made using tools uh, like these examples I have of TileMill or Mapputnik that are free and open source. Now, um, so one interesting aspect is that these tools are still um, based around these cartographic principles, uh, such as having point, line, and polygon features and having varying uh, sort of graphical elements like fill, stroke, and color. Um, so these principles are very general and in, in sort of uh, more historic cases, they were implemented using pen and paper or woodblock. But in sort of the digital era, they're implemented using graphics uh, on these computers. And in the 80s, this might have meant using uh, like ASCII art to make maps. But nowadays, it's done using these graphics APIs. Uh, so I have this example of a 2D graphics APIs uh, with Cairo. Um, but the important thing to know is that these graphics APIs are very low level and are not specific to making maps. So in order to be productive in doing cartography, we need some sort of higher level abstraction. And if you've used a slippy map uh, system for making maps, in this case, um, I'm using Mapnik as an example. You might be familiar with a system. In this case, uh, you sort of write these XML style sheets. You might have uh, the symbolizer classes called things like marker symbolizer, now, where you can pass it a stroke width or a color for fill and a text symbolizer for points or labels. And you'll get a result uh, that's much like on the bottom with circle symbols and with text symbols, for example. And for lines, the equivalent is something like a line symbolizer that has a stroke width and a stroke color. For polygons, you might have a polygon symbolizer that has a fill color. And if we combine all these together, we get something that looks kind of like a base map. Um, but this is not quite sufficient because if you've worked with it, in the case you've worked with these systems before, uh, they're all very scale dependent. So you might want your map to change the appearance or change the properties of these symbols based on the scale. And this, uh, is often at a global scale. So you need some sort of automated or rules-based system. Um, and the most basic of these is to have proportion based on scale. So there's some relationship between the symbology like line width and the scale of the map. And in this example of Mapnik, you might have a uh, sort of limit as to what scale this rule applies on it might be a one pixel stroke at this scale and a two pixel stroke at this scale. Um, and the result is that when you zoom in on the map, then the width of the feature changes. So this is a very common operation among all slipping map systems. And another common operation is filtering. You might want to only select one portion of the data to symbolize. And in this case, you might have a line symbol that has a green stroke but you only wanted to apply to one class of features like highways. So you need to define some sort of query or filter to only, uh, to like only choose that one kind of feature. And another kind um, of operation you might wanna do is a casing or a repeat of a feature. And in this case, you might have a black background stroke, and then a white inner stroke to have uh, these casings on roads. And finally, uh, there's also lots of these cartographic properties related to labels. 
like you might have different neighborhoods in a city that are point features, but you want to place the labels intelligently based on the surrounding context. So you have some sort of definition of how the labels are laid out. So as these rules grow, they, um, they can become pretty unwieldy if you have a lot of them. So we need an even higher level of abstraction or some sort of cartographic language to encompass this. Uh, so in some cases, this, this is implemented as a preprocessor. Um, so this like small amount of computation becomes quite expressive. And some examples are systems like Cardo CSS or Cascadenic or like JSON or like YAML based languages. Uh, so one important, uh, one kind of important aspect of this is that a language um, is not successful because it has lots of bells and whistles. It's successful if it has uh, these nice ergonomic properties, like if it's obvious how you can change or modify the style, or if that language is really sort of expressive in its cartographic ideas. So one example of this is reuse. Um, for this example of Cardo CSS, I have a line color defined only once, but then at different zoom levels, I only need to define the line width and it inherits this line color from that parent rule. And another example um, is the idea of variables or parameters. So if I have water bodies that are symbolized at different zoom levels, I might want to define the color as a variable and extract it out and then just repeat that. And that's really powerful if I wanted to have these variations of a certain map, such as having a dark mode and a light mode. I can only have one map style and then extract out all the parameters into a different place. And another powerful idea that's in these map languages is the idea of um, a sort of function for a property. In this case, um, I'm using sort of the Mapbox GL JSON language, which has the line width expressed as a function of zoom level. So the result here is based on this expression, I can have map features that scale based on the zoom level. And in some cases, I might even go down in abstraction, which is uh, in this example of uh, uh, of like the Tangram YAML system, I'm able to embed these GLSL shaders directly inside of the YAML. And this is like pretty low level, but it's able to allow me to do things like have textures uh, that are really crisp on my map. So my observations from these map systems are first that if you wanna make a practical base map for the web, it can demand hundreds of rules or more. Um, and in a lot of cases, they use a familiar syntax like CSS or they might be inside of JSON, but that's kind of a double-edged sword because being familiar is powerful if you're a web designer or if you're a graphic designer, then it might be easy to make changes. On the other hand, once you introduce more and more computational concepts, it becomes more expressive, but it also becomes uh, more sort of a power user experience. So, um, in the past year, I've been exploring the idea of instead of assembling a language from cartographic principles from the bottom up, instead building these principles inside of an existing language. So the system I'm working on is called ProtoMaps.js, and it is a cartographic language inside of JavaScript. It runs inside the web browser and is based on the Canvas 2D graphics API. So as a very basic example, I might have a symbolizing rule, such as um, to translate the previous mapping example, I have a polygon symbolizer. But in this case, I have a fill variable. And at the very top, I have a color variable. And I just refer to that directly. It's just plain old JavaScript. Um, and one really powerful idea is to, to actually define these properties not as constants, but as functions. So in this case, I have a fill color that is expressed as the function of zoom level and also the feature. So if the feature has a certain property, like the kind property has the value natural, I return one color, else I return a different color. And I can also do a filtering over my features for this rule based on zoom and feature.
such as limiting the scale rank property to those less than six. And to uh, have another example of this concept, I might define the width of my line symbolizer as a mathematical function of zoom. And in this case, it's like a power relationship. So when I zoom in, my widths are getting wider by a power function. And one other idea is this idea of instead of having a pre-baked set of symbolizers like line and polygon symbolizer, um, I'm able to implement my own inside of dynamic JavaScript. So in this case, I'm able to directly issue calls to the underlying API um, and draw a triangle based on the coordinates and also uh, show text. So in this case, I have uh, these populated places around Oklahoma City that I'm symbolizing with a triangle and also the population count. And finally, there's this idea of composition, which is that in my map, I might want to symbolize a feature as a circle in one case, such as a circle with a fill and a stroke. Those populated places are symbolized here by these black dots. But I might also want a text in order to show the name of the place. So I symbolize them with a certain font size, uh, such as these neighborhood names. And this idea of being able to compose symbolizers is to have one symbolizer called group where I can pass in these separate symbolizers and combine them on the map. So in this case, I have these black dots with labels on top of them. And the cartographic system handles all of the things like label collisions and bounding boxes in order to make that really intuitive and powerful. So that is sort of a whirlwind overview of the features of this language or the system embedded inside of JavaScript. It is on GitHub. It's practical to use with Leaflet for base maps. It consumes the popular MBT vector tile format, and it is free and open source software. So the benefits of doing things this way are that it is a complete programming language. Uh, so these uh, concepts like composition or parameters are really powerful cartographic tools. And if you want to, you, could, you also have direct access to the underlying API. So the drawbacks of doing things this way are also that it's a complete programming language. If you make typos, um, it will crash your program. It is inaccessible, um, or it's more difficult to use if you don't have a programming background. Uh, it's, not, it's very different than the buttons and sliders sort of GUI Photoshop uh, experience for making maps. And it's suited only for rendering on the CPU and not these newer sort of GPU accelerated experiences. So in conclusion, uh, I am working on new tools to make, slippy map, to make slippy map cartography more simple, expressive, and fun. So you can try ProtoMaps.js, which is a vector map renderer for the web, on GitHub, and use it for your projects. If you have questions or ideas on how to improve this, feel free to contact me. Thanks.